creation is the process of investing in various asset types to meet critical future demands. Individuals can generate wealth in a variety of ways and entities can generate alternative streams of income by investing in good assets. Any financial decision is said to generate wealth if the present value of future cash flows relevant to that decision exceeds the cost paid to carry out that activity. The present value of future cash flows minus the cost and investment equals the increase in wealth. In essence, it's a financial decision's net present value or NPV. As a part of retirement plans, many times people try to secure income in the form of interest or dividends by investing in avenues like blue chip stocks, mutual funds, or government bonds. Wealth creation is essential for individuals' purposes like better quality of life, social status, future circumstances, debt repayments to fulfill needs, as well as goals, desires, and aspirations. Firms need to create wealth to gain the confidence of stakeholders like shareholders and creditors for a better market standing, for tapping expansion opportunities, and for resilience during bearish market conditions. Nations need wealth to support the economy from headwinds like inflationary pressure, health crises like the pandemic, unemployment, etc. At a global level, a country's wealth is seen as an indicator of its power and ability to influence decision making on various international matters. What is wealth in an economic analysis? Well, in economics, wealth is a person's household's or a country's net worth. That is, the value of all the assets held minus the liabilities payable at a given moment in time. It's important to know that the terms of wealth and income are used in economics to differentiate between the two. A nation's gold reserves at the point in time are its wealth, while its national health care expenditure is a flow variable measured quarterly or annually or over a period of time. What is personal wealth? Well, personal wealth is the overall worth of a person's assets and belongings in the form of savings, investments, cash or real estate minus the debt. It's frequently computed to get a sense of a person's financial well-being. To assist them with financial management or to assess the size of an inheritance. Personal wealth is often calculated by calculating three areas. First, liquid assets, which are defined as readily available money or anything that can be sold or redeemed for money fast. Second, the value of belongings, which are described as anything that cannot be rapidly swapped for money. And third, any outstanding debts. For example, let's say Mr. X has a mansion and a car worth 500,000 US dollars and 20,000 US dollars respectively. His savings account has a balance of $35,000. Added together, these assets are worth $555,000. However, he has a college debt of 10,000 US dollars, credit card dues of 7,000 and a car loan of 13,000. Thus is the net worth of Mr. X is worth everything left in over after clearing off the liabilities. The net worth will be $525,000. How about a nation's wealth? How is it estimated? Often the gross domestic product of a nation is deemed to be its wealth. However, that is not true because GDP is the income of a nation. Also, GDP is measured over a period of time and thus is flow variable, while wealth, as explained above, is a stock variable. To determine a country's wealth, the first thing we need to assess is its gross assets. Gross assets are like the sum of tangible and financial assets of the nation. Real estate, such as homes and businesses and automobiles, consumer durable goods are examples of tangible or non-financial assets. On the other hand, financial assets include things like bank accounts, business stocks and bonds, and tax-deferred retirement funds. 
as well as corporate equities, mutual fund shares, pension fund reserves, and equity in non-corporate businesses. Nations, too, may borrow the finance asset purchases. Therefore, to assess the net worth, outstanding liabilities or debts like mortgages, credit card debt, auto loans, etc., one must be deducted from the gross assets. Thus, we can conclude that nation's net worth is the excess of its gross assets, overall its liabilities. Well, I hope you see wealth in a new light now. If you like this info, give us a like, comment and a share on our video. Please sub to our channel and while you're at it, press that bell icon. For regular updates and info, log on to our website at calkinemedia.com. This has been Holly Shields for Calkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. for Calcine Media, subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. In today's trending topic, we're covering COVID-19, a tailwind for pet care. What does the future hold? They say pets are the best friend of humans, and that has never been truer than during the pandemic, as officials urged people to stay at home and reduced contact to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, many people found companionship through pets. And according to the Worldwide Animal Shelters, the increase in adoptions of animals has left the kennels nearly vacant. Furthermore, animal health players are getting a significant boost this year, all credit to young consumers spending more on pets during the pandemic. Owners are now increasingly taking care of their pets and the trend is likely to continue even after COVID-19 is over. Besides, the awareness of animal well-being has never been higher with pet parents spending more time with their pets and this is prioritizing the need for innovative approaches to animal health such as pet therapy a treatment for stress and anxiety amid the pandemic pet therapy has become popular medicines for humans and this therapy aids patients in recovering from several health issues and the popular name for it is animal assisted therapy in this form of therapy an organized contact between human and animal is created and the handlers either pet owners or volunteers are also involved in the engagement the purpose of this animal based therapy is to help people recover from a variety of ailments including cardiovascular indications, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, stroke, mental illness and many more. Challenges in the pet care industry. There have been reports of pets dying due to accidents or injuries outside the home and besides an increasing number of pets are developing chronic indications associated with aging and their environment. These include cancer, cardiovascular indications, neurological disorders and gastrointestinal diseases. And just like the owners, pets are also likely to get some muscle and joint pain as they get older. All this is developing into a challenging situation in the animal health industry and there is significant need to develop innovative therapeutics for the treatment of these animal diseases. And with the increased focus on pets health, the industry is expected to see a considerable demand for products and services in the future. Thanks for joining us in that report and if you like this information please like, share and comment on the video below and subscribe to the YouTube channel. 
press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos and for more information and regular updates please head to the website calkinemedia.com and this is Sage for Calkine Media. Good afternoon, thanks for joining me on Kalkine TV. James Preston with you for the Economic Corner, where we bring you all the latest economic developments from across the globe. This week is loaded with key economic events, including the June US Consumer Price Index data release. Retail sales and industrial production information will also be released in addition to the release of extra data on top of that. In other words, there's a lot to get through. There are also meetings scheduled for the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, the Bank of Canada and the Bank of Japan. Let's get stuck into this action-packed week by beginning with the G20. G20 finance ministers have collectively endorsed carbon pricing for the very first time in order to try and tackle climate change. G20 finance ministers said that tackling climate change, biodiversity, and also promoting environmental protection remains urgent in their priority stakes. The group further added that the solutions could include the use of carbon pricing, mechanisms and also incentives. This is the first time that support for a carbon price in a communique has been expressed. In the United States, inflation data could provide a scare ahead of testimony by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell on Wednesday and Thursday, where markets will be hypersensitive to any talk of early tapering. The earnings season also kicks off with JP Morgan, Goldman and Sachs, Citigroup and Wells Fargo among those reporting. In Asia, China will release figures on economic growth, trade, retail sales and industrial output amid concerns they could underwhelm given the sudden easing in policy last week. According to Westpac, expectations around China's outlook have soured over the past month as a result of some disappointing data, which was intensified by the optics of coming off peak growth from the pandemic recovery. Moving on, it's not just the members of the G20 who have been discussing broad-based climate action. Speaking at the Venice International Conference on Climate, the day after the G20 talks, the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, emphasise the importance of a, quote, effective carbon price that reflects the true cost of carbon. A carbon price is a necessary precursor to the establishment of a carbon border tax, which would serve as a tariff on imports from countries without carbon pricing. William Nordhaus, an American economist and Nobel laureate, gave the keynote address at the conference calling for a, quote, climate club of countries who are willing to commit to a carbon price. He added that such an approach would help solve the problem of free riding, which has plagued existing global climate agreements, all of which are voluntary. From the climate to eccentric billionaires, and Elon Musk is expected to testify over the Tesla acquisition of Solar City, which was worth $2.6 billion. Solar City is Elon Musk's solar energy startup that was teetering just before Tesla bought it in 2016 for $2.6 billion worth of Tesla shares. Tesla shareholders have alleged that Musk engineered the buyout not to create an integrated clean energy powerhouse as he claimed, but to use the carmaker's balance sheet to bail out one of his grandiose projects. Musk's economic and voting interest in the company was just 22%, but the suing shareholders alleged that the sheer force of Musk's persona allowed him to dominate the Tesla board. So if the court finds that Musk acted as a controlling shareholder, he might face a higher legal bar in proving that the deal was reasonable for all shareholders. All right, time now for a quick break on Calcine TV. And on the other side of these messages, some updates from Australia's most prudent regulator. This is Andy Liu broadcasting from Calkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Calkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Calkine TV and join me.
Welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us on Cowkind TV. I'm James Preston and you're watching The Economic Corner. Let's now look at concerns Australia's chief regulating body has been indicating in relation to the banking sector. Australia's Prudential Regulation Authority, or APRA, has told banks that they must have a plan to deal with the possibility of zero or negative interest rates by April 2022. The regulator alarmed the banks after a consultation showed such rates could pose operational challenges in some instances. While the Reserve Bank of Australia has repeatedly said that a negative cash rate in the country is highly unlikely, APRA said it is possible that other interest rates determined in the financial markets could fall to zero or below zero at any time. APRA is thus asking banks to take reasonable steps to prepare for such a scenario and develop tactical solutions to implement zero and negative market interest rates and cash rates by the 30th of April 2022. An APRA banking official said that the tactical solutions are typically shorter term fixes involving workarounds on the periphery of existing systems along with overrides in downstream systems. APRA considers the risk arising from a bank's lack of preparedness for zero and negative interest rates to be material since this could have significant implications for risk management, hedging, operational processes, contracts, product disclosures, IT and accounting systems amongst other areas. Some banks said that they were well placed to deal with zero and negative market rates on financial products, typically handled by their treasury systems. Others said such rates on their retail lending or deposit products would pose operational challenges. Notably, Australia's cash rate has remained at a record low of 0.10% since November 2020. Yields on short-term government notes turned negative for the first time ever last month. APRA's consultation period began in December and will continue until August 20 before the regulator finalises its expectations by October 31. Moving on to some important economic data announcements. Japanese wholesale prices continued to surge in June as import costs spiked at the fastest pace on record. According to the latest data released by the Bank of Japan, the numbers were a clear sign of rising raw material costs that were weighing on corporate profits. Households may also start to feel the pinch as recent increases in oil costs are likely to push up consumer inflation in the coming months. Though the rebound is expected to be more modest in Japan than in other advanced nations due to weak demand. The Corporate Goods Price Index, or the CGPI, which measures the price companies charge each other for their goods and services, rose 5% in June from a year earlier. Time now for a short break on Cowkind TV. I'll be back with you in just a moment with more important economic data and some updates from the pandemic recovery front. Crypto talk by Kalkine. The crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Thanks for tuning in to Kaokai TV. James Preston with you for the Economic Corner, where we update you on all the biggest global economic announcements. Moving on to some important updates coming from Canada, and Ottawa has announced that its Pay Equity Act will come into effect on August 31, which is about three years after the legislation was first unveiled. Andrea Gunraj, Vice President of Public Engagement at the Canadian Women's Foundation, believes that it's a good starting point but further discussion and regulation is needed to make sure more people benefit from the regulations. Gender equality advocates and labour experts say that with the legislation going into effect later this summer, there are expectations of a reduction in the pay gap between women and men in some Canadian workplaces. Though it remains unclear whether those gains will ripple out across the larger economy. And lastly, moving on to the state of the pandemic across the globe, finance ministers of the world's 20th largest economies warned that an upsurge in new coronavirus variants and poor access to vaccines in developing countries is threatening the global economic recovery. 
The G20 gathering in Venice was the minister's first face-to-face -face meeting since the start of the pandemic. The global economic outlook had improved since G20 talks in April with the rollout of vaccines and economic support packages. But the communique acknowledged that its fragility in the face of variants like the fast spreading Delta and the G20 nations promised to use all policy tools to try and combat COVID-19. The communique, while stressing support for equitable global sharing of vaccines, did not propose concrete measures in the meet. Though a mere acknowledgement for a recommendation for $50 billion in new vaccine financing by the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, World Health Organization and World Trade Organization was made by the board. All right, that's all for this edition of the Economic Corner. Hope you enjoyed the program and gained some insight into the current state of economic affairs. Please stay tuned for our final live show of the day, Last Trades with Sage. I'm James Preston, signing off. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. or night owls, which sleeping habit is healthier? Hi and welcome to Kalkine Wellness. I'm Andy Lou from Kalkine Media and today we'll be addressing sleeping habits on the show. Are you an early riser or are you a night owl? Let's look at which sleeping habit is healthier for you. Most millennials and zillennials love to stay up late and end up sleeping late in the afternoon after having put their alarm clocks several times on snooze. But then there are others who don't even need an alarm clock to wake up and synchronize with the uh, circadian rhythms. A lot of people sleep early uh, default while others are hardwired to sleep late and the preference is modulated by each person's internal and unique body clock, of course their lifestyle, but this is the circadian system. And the preference is known as chronotypes. While early risers are most productive in the morning, the opposite is true for late sleepers. Now, the body has another chronotype apart from what decides whether we are early risers or late sleepers. And there are those who sleep a little later than early risers and are more productive in the afternoon. While early risers are known to have an interrupted eight hours of sleep mostly, sleeping early does not automatically make one healthy. You know, it has to be supplemented with other healthy habits too, like eating healthy, exercising regularly, or just moving around and just not living that sedentary lifestyle. If you make healthy life choices, any sleep cycle will keep you healthy. However, there are certain benefits that only early risers will enjoy. Early risers generally tend to be on the move more than other sort of late night risers. And recent studies published in the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Science showed that early risers tend to move one on or one to one and a half hours more than late risers throughout the day. Late risers were found to move less and spend longer periods sitting down. The tendency to become inactive among those who sleep late can be bad for people with diabetes or heart conditions. Diabetes is a lifestyle disease that's very common and approximately 1 in 11 people globally are said to be suffering from it. So. If your chronotype is towards the evening, it's important to add activities to your schedule accordingly to make it a healthy lifestyle. 
The advantages of being an early riser are many, so let's go through them. It gives one a whole lot of time for themselves in the morning. Just when you thought you had no time, all of a sudden you've got a lot more. There are no more emails from work to attend to yet, no social groups buzzing quite constantly with messages, and no friends calling you up. They're all hopefully sleeping. Uh, since there's less interruption, productivity is higher, which leaves you with enough time to finish your exercise routine, to-do lists, or to simply sip on that cup of tea whilst watching the day or the bay. <laughs> Begin without any interruption is always a treat. Also, the sense of urgency is lower, which allows you to improve your stress levels and your experiences such as putting together the breakfast, watching the sunrise, or listening to birds and getting more connected with nature. Early risers are also better prepared to deal with the pressure of the day. Rising early allows you enough time to shake off any drowsiness and regain your energy gradually so that by the time work begins and the pressure mounts, you are better prepared to handle it. Now if you think that changing your body clock is an uphill task, you're mistaken. It's okay to take it slow, so start by waking up just 15 minutes earlier than your regular time and increase the time each week to develop the habit in a sustainable way. Convince your mind to sleep early with a good reason to wake up early, like grabbing a delicious breakfast that you might go out for or make for yourself. So maybe you should skip that late night movie all the scrolling and set yourself with a list of goals to tick off in the morning so that you have a real good reason to try and wake up early instead. If you like this information, please like, share and comment on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon to get the latest notifications. For regular updates and information in general for all of our videos, do log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. And you're watching Andy Lou with Calkine Wellness. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. For Kalkine Media, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. In today's trending topic, we're covering which investments are inflation proof. Inflation measures the level of price rise over a given time duration and investors may find themselves in a tight spot when prices are rising as inflation would eat away at the returns offered by the investment and the nominal returns offered by an investment might be increasing. However, the real returns would be lower due to inflation and thus investors prefer inflation proof methods of investment or those investments which benefit from inflation. However, it is essential to note that returns are not guaranteed anywhere when an investment is made. At best, inflation-proof investments could provide safety against the rising price levels. So before considering such an investment option, here are certain inflation-related aspects to consider. Inflation and types of investments. For inflation proof returns, the investments must have certain characteristics that allow investors to enjoy real returns. And some of these include high growth investments. Investors must focus on instruments that can offer high growth rather than simple income. Fixed income assets are generally the worst hit assets during inflation. And if the returns are growing at par or above the rising prices, investors can enjoy some level of security against the price rise. 
real investments. Nominal assets are bound to be hurt under inflationary pressures. Assets like a certificate of deposit or traditional bonds are priced based on the fixed returns offered by them. And real assets are tangible and holds an inherent value. Thus, um, commodity prices are rising. The prices of these physical assets are also likely to shoot up. Investors can hold some amount of their investments as physical or real assets. Variable interest assets. Unlike the fixed interest assets, variable interest assets can be more useful in an inflationary environment. Interest rates may also rise with inflation, giving the investor a chance to recuperate his losses. Investments to turn to during inflation. Gold. Gold is considered a hedge against inflation and gold has been used as a medium of exchange in old times and it continues to be an asset of interest due to its intrinsic value. Unlike fiat money, gold holds an inherent value that makes it attractive to investors. When the domestic currency is losing value, gold is also used as an alternative. Investing in gold not just means buying a physical asset. Gold derivatives are also a standard method through which some level hedging can be done against rising prices. So individuals can buy shares and bonds in gold. Digital gold is soon gaining recognition among investors. Physical delivery can easily take place. And additionally, gold is a highly liquid asset and can be easily converted into cash. Commodities. One can invest in commodities like oil, electricity, natural gas and precious metals to make use of rising prices. Just like gold, the price of these commodities rises with increasing inflation. Metals like silver and copper are also commodities worth looking at. And many of these commodities are seen as an indicator of rising prices. An important factor to consider in commodity trading is the impact of underlying demand and supply of the commodity and factors of demand and supply make commodity prices as well as the prices of their derivatives volatile. Real Estate Investment Trusts REITs Investing in Property During inflation can be a clever way to secure profits. Often property prices skyrocket under inflationary pressures and are highly reflective of the real value of the assets in the market. REITs gather pooled sums of money, invest those in property and pay out dividends to their investors. The dividends paid out by the REITs are subject to taxation. Thus, investors must be wary of the level of taxation and how much returns would be achieved. REITs allow investors to invest as per their affordability. Dividend paying and growth stocks. Dividend paying stocks can be a refuge for investors in stressful times if investors are losing out on their investment gains due to inflation. Dividend stocks give them an opportunity to lock in additional income. If the yield is higher than the annual inflation rate, then investors can obtain higher real returns. Growth stocks can also be a good option to invest in. Generally, when prices of commodities are rising, companies are also able to draw in higher profits. And while input costs are also rising, some stocks can outperform the industry average. These stocks are known as growth stocks and they are generally issued by companies engaged in technology or medicine. And these companies can lock in higher profits due to new products or techniques developed by them. Geographic diversification. It is possible that only the domestic stock market is adversely affected by the inflation. However, international markets are not affected as badly. It is a good idea to invest in foreign stocks or international bonds to lock in profits in such a case. Treasury Inflation Protected Securities or TIPS. TIPS are issued by the US government and are inflation indexed securities. This means that their returns move in sync with the level of inflation in the market. And this keeps investors secured from inflationary pressures, eating away at the value of their investments. The principal value, if TIPS increases, 
as inflation rises, which is measured through CPI. However, TIPS may offer lower interest than other securities and government bodies. And these returns are government backed and are thus considered secure. Thus, it is possible to obtain gains from the market even when the market is down. Investors must make wise decisions depending on the market scenario. Thanks so much for joining us in that report. If you like this information, please like, share and comment on the video below and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Press the bell icon to get notified of the latest videos and for more information and regular updates, please head to the website calkinemedia.com. This is Sage for Calkine Media. This is Andy Liu broadcasting from Kalkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Kalkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Kalkine TV and join me. We know copper is becoming an increasingly prominent component of many investors' portfolios due to the increased importance of batteries, but it's not the only metal showing a serious uptick. Silver is, much like the commodity itself, shining at present in the world of stocks. According to global data, Global silver production is estimated to increase by 8.1% to around 918.3 million ounces in 2021. And despite silver production being impacted over the past 12 months due to COVID, global data is forecasting a production rate of more than 1 billion ounces by 2024. That's an approximate 3.2% compound annual growth rate. So silver looks to have a promising future. And in just a moment, we'll take a look at what the largest silver reserve in Australia is and who owns it. But first, make sure to subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon to stay up to date with the latest videos from Kaokai. Located in the northwest region of Queensland, the Cannington Underground Mine holds the crown for being the largest silver mine in Australia. Apart from producing silver, the Cannington Mine is also rich in lead and zinc. It's owned by South32 Limited, which is a newly formed division of previous owners BHP Billiton. In fact, the Cannington Mine holds one of the world's largest silver deposits overall. The mine itself has been in production for the last 20 years and requires 550 full-time employees and up to 300 contractors to keep up the production. At Cannington, South32 is able to reliably get the product from the mine to market on the back of a high capacity processing plant a shiploader at the port of Townsville and a road to rail transfer facility. Almost all of the country's silver is produced as a byproduct of underground copper or lead zinc mines. But South 32's Cannington mine is one of the very few silver deposits in Australia which produces silver as a principal extracted commodity. Looking at the company's financials, for the first half of the 2021 fiscal year, they recorded a statutory net profit after tax of $53 million, supported by a 9% reduction in the cost base and higher sales volumes. The strong production volumes and the realisation of further cost efficiencies on the back of lower operating unit costs have resulted in a 4% increase in underlying earnings to $136 million. South 32's net cash as of the end of January 2021 has increased to US $452 million, up from $275 million. That's as of the 31st of December 2020. And management is confident that South 32 is well positioned to benefit as the global economy recovers. Now just before we wrap up, it's important to take a look at South 32's position on the stock market. The S32 share price has comfortably outperformed the ASX 200 average return of 12.67%, delivering a healthy return of 21.2%. However, when compared to its peers, the performance is less than stellar. 
Champion Iron, for example, delivered an astronomical 38.74% return year to date, primarily due to skyrocketing iron ore prices this year. Its other two peers, Blue Scope Limited and Sims Metals Management, have been hard to beat, delivering 26.91% and 23.93% respectively. Comparatively, South32 is the worst performer, but it's still a stock well worth looking into, especially with silver's growing prominence combined with S32's focus on the metal itself. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, then make sure to like, comment and share, and of course, click the bell icon and subscribe to the channel to stay apprised across all of our videos. For any further info, just head across the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston for Calkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Hi, this is Andy Liu broadcasting from Kalkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Kalkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Calkine TV and join me. Afternoon viewers, welcome back. This is Sage. You're watching Calkine TV Live from the Sydney studio. And this is the last show of the day, the last trade. Let's see how the Australian share market performed today. While the trading session is heading towards a close. Well, the Australian shares are heading towards a positive close on Monday, driven by strong rallies in the mining and the realty stocks as well as the healthcare and banking stocks. And the market was off from the day's high due to selling pressures witnessed in utilities, consumer staples, energy and telecom stocks. The concerns about rising COVID-19 infections in the country also weighed on the market sentiments. And as per the latest update, the country's most populous state of New South Wales has reported 112 locally acquired COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours. And this is the highest daily number of new infections reported in the state so far. The S&P ASX 200 was trading above 
0.7% at 7,319.10 during the final hour of the day's trade. And earlier today, the index opened higher and gained as much as 1.1% to hit an intraday high of 7,353, crossing above its 20-day moving average. The market breath indicating the overall strength of the market was positive, with majority of the 11 sectoral indices trading in the green. And the material sector was the top performer with 2% gains. Among others, AREIT, Healthcare, Financial Information Technology and Consumer Discretionary were the notable gainers. And meanwhile, utilities sector was the worst performer on the ASX with a 0.4% loss. Among others, telecom, consumer, staples and energy were the top laggards. And on this note, let's now see how the sectoral indices performed today. The information technology staged a smart recovery, rebounding over 0.6%, tracking firm cues from the US counterpart NASDAQ. In the tech space, buy now, pay later, giant afterpay and software firm Nearmap were among the top gainers, while the network operator Megaport and fintech firm Zipco were under the pressure. In the energy space, index heavyweight Woodside Petroleum, Origin Energy, Beach Energy and Ampol were trading in the green territory, while Santos and Oil Search slipped into the red. Then in the mining sector, index heavyweights BHP Group, Rio Tinto and Fortescue Metals Group were trading higher, owing to the rise in the iron ore futures on the Dalian Commodity Exchange. And the rally in the resource stocks were also supported by the People's Bank of China's decision to cut the reserve requirement ratio, or RRR, for all banks by 50 basis points, the amount of cash most banks must hold in reserve to boost lending. And moving on now. Among the gold stocks, sectoral major degray mining, Romelius Resources, Newcrest Mining and the smaller Pier Chalice Mining were among the leading gainers. And next in the banking sector, all of Australia's big four lenders, Commonwealth Bank of Australia, Australia New Zealand Banking Group and the Westpac Banking Corporation as well as the National Australia Bank were trading higher today. And moving on again, let's now have a quick look at the top gainers and losers of the day. Civil and mining contractor NRW Holdings was the top percentage gainer on the ASX pack, rising over 10% on a plan to sell its major mining equipment to Bogabri Coal Operations or Bogabri Coal Operations. Some of the other notable gainers were the energy firm Viva Energy Miners, Mineral Resources, Nickel Mines and the tech firm Nearmap. And on the flip side, the global online marketplace Redbubble was the top loser on the ASX, falling nearly 3%. Some of the other notable losers include professional services company Worley, fintech firm Hub24 and the investment firm Washington H. Sol Pattinson and infant formula company A2 Milk Company. Let's now take a look at the Australian shares that created a buzz today. Investors cheered the resurgence in corporate mergers and acquisitions or M&A activity. In a major M&A development, Australian conglomerate West Farmers unveiled its plan to foray into Australia's $25 billion pharmacy sector after making a $687 million bid to acquire the local pharmaceutical retailer and distributor Australian Pharmaceutical Industries or API. Reacting to the news, shares of West Farmers gained as much as 0.9%, reaching $58.54 Australian. The company, the owner of Australian retail chain Kmart and Bunnings, has proposed to acquire 100% of API's shares, outstanding for $1.38 Australian cash per share by way of a scheme of arrangement. The bid price represents a 21% premium to API's last close price of $1.145 Australian per share. Boosted by the development, shares of Australian Pharmaceutical Industries, or API, rallied as much as 20.5% to hit an intraday high of $1.38 Australian. In other M&A news, mining services company NRW Holdings has announced that it would sell its major mining equipment to Bogabri Coal Operations, and Bogabri Coal is a part of Idemitsu Group and can exercise options to acquire a majority of mining equipment of Golding contractors, its wholly owned subsidiary. And Golding is engaged in the maintenance of the Bogabri Coal Mine. 
Moving on, Chalice Mining shares gained as much as 3.13%, reaching $7.57 Australian after Australian miner said it would split its gold asset. And Chalice Mining is an exchange filing, or in an exchange filing on Monday, unveiled a plan to split its Australian gold assets to create a separate, standalone, well-funded Australian gold exploration company with a high-quality asset base in Victoria and Western Australia. The company believes that the demerger of gold-focused entity would be an optimal structure to maximise value for its shareholders. And the exploration and production company has decided to pursue a demerger, an initial public offering or IPO of Pyramid Hill and its other gold projects in the fourth quarter of 2021. And this would be subject to finalisation of the transaction structure and nod from shareholder and regulators. Then the shares of Iron Road gained as much as 8.3% to 26 cents after iron ore miner said it has executed contracts to acquire 24 hectares of Gulf Front land at Cape Hardy and this adds to the 1,100 hectares of Port Precinct land already owned by the firm. Iron Road said the total consideration for the purchase and ongoing Cape Hardy development costs is expected to be about 1 million Australian dollars this quarter. Next up, the shares of Range International Limited fell as much as 14% down to 1.2 cents on the rising COVID-19 cases in its Indonesian facility. The plastic pallet manufacturer says 28 staff in Indonesian facility or in the Indonesian facility turned positive for COVID-19. It stated the impact on the company operations is currently minimal. It added the company will reduce one shift per day for the time being and will make up its loss in production by extending other shifts with overtime and employing new daily workers as required. And now it's time for a short break but please stay tuned as I'll be back with the trending updates for the Australian share market. Welcome back, Sage here, your host live from Calcine Studios in Sydney, and you're watching The Last Trade. Moving on now, shares of phosphate maker Fertos Limited gained as much as 16% to 32.5 cents. The company stated its carbon division, Fertos Carbon, has executed an agreement with the US listed Trimble Inc. to allow carbon credits generated in the Fertos' agriculture and reforestation projects to be traded. Let us look at the next news maker. Shares of Okapi Resources climbed as much as 38.6%, reaching 30.5 cents. The Gold Explorer is all set to acquire Tallahassee Resources, PTY Limited, which holds a portfolio of uranium projects in the United States. And then the digital lender Quick Fee fell as much as 3.8%, down to 0.8%. 255 Australian dollars after advancing earlier, 11.3%, up to 29.5 cents on week earnings forecasts. The company stated it expects 2021 financial year losses after tax to be between 8 to 9 million Australian dollars, bigger than last year's loss of 3.8 million Australian dollars. Next up, the share price of the software firm Objective Corporation Limited gained 0.5% after the company reported strong earnings in the financial year 21. The company saw its revenue growing by 36%, while the annual recurring revenue, or ARR, surged 31%, as compared to the last fiscal. And meanwhile, shares of Live Verdure surged over 2.5% to 20 cents after the company announced the launch of its first therapeutic goods administration approved product. And the company has registered first sales of its new scientifically formulated turmeric capsules, Thera Joint Plus. And then Sayona Mining Limited dropped as much as 13.4%, down to 8.4 cents. After discounted equity raise on Monday, the lithium producer has raised 45 million Australian dollars via a share placement and has plans to raise another 5 million Australian dollars in a retail offering. 
Last but not least, Australian biotech firm MedLab Clinical. Shares rose over 3% to 16 cents after the Australian Ethics Grant's approval for the Nanobiz Cancer Bone Pain Phase 3 trial. And Nanobiz is MedLab's most advanced non-opioid pain medication utilising MedLab's patented delivery platform NanoCell. Let's now take a look at the Asian market's performance. The equity markets in the Asia-Pacific region were trading in the green, snapping Friday's losses amid firm queues from Wall Street. In Japan, the benchmark Nikkei 225 was up 2%, while the Topics Index jumped 1.78%. In neighbouring South Korea, the benchmark Kospi also advanced 0.95%. In a similar trend, Taiwan Capitalisation Weighted Stock Index traded 0.85% higher, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng rose 0.7%. Singapore's Straits Times was up 0.25%. And China's Shanghai Composite was up 0.9% after the People's Bank of China. China on Friday slashed the reserve requirement ratio, or RRR, for all banks by 50 basis points to boost the economic growth. The move may uplift the credit takeoff in the economy, which has been witnessing early signs of a slowdown. And on Friday, all three major U.S. stock indices ended higher as financials and other economically focused sectors rebounded from a sell-off sparked by the growth worries earlier in the week. The S&P 500 rose 1.13 per cent, the Dow Jones gained 1.30 per cent and the Nasdaq Composite added 0.98 per cent. And thanks for joining us in our live updates today. That's all for now and Sage signing off, but we will be bringing you more stock updates and market charters in our shows tomorrow, so please stay tuned with Kalkine TV for more live updates across the economy, markets and sectors. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calkine TV. Welcome you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. The show where we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. On today's show we're joined by Kurt Sandman, the Managing Director of Tractor, a company that lives and breathes agribusiness to help businesses bring greater depth to their communication efforts. Welcome to the show, Kurt. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me on board. Great to have you on. So to kick things off, we know that the future generations depend on companies like yours to extract greater value from natural produce. To achieve this, I'm told Tractor has five distinct pillars. Could you please explain what they are? Yeah, sure. I think um, just to kick off, you know, the, the statement um, that future generations depend on us to extract greater value. Well, you know, that, that in itself is really, um, I think, you know, the agricultural environments in both Australia and New Zealand at present is experiencing quite a heavy amount of disruption, um, whether it's regulation, um, whether it's environmental um, pressures or uh, technolo technological disruption as well. I think that, you know, there's quite a significant um, or complex environment that they're all facing. And, yeah, it's really, um, as agricultural marketers, we feel that, um, you know, we've, both New Zealand and Australia have high quality products um, that they provide to the world. And I think that, you know, we believe that we in the markets that they're operating in at the moment are heavily price driven and there's not much sort of brand or quality that stands behind it. So our job at Tractor is to really extract more value for these uh, producers and growers who are really telling their stories and, um, you know, putting more brand in front of the products that they sell so they're worth um, to provide greater value to export markets. So within that, you know, we've got five distinct colours that um, are our, is our service model that we sit behind to help them do that. And the first one's obviously quality of research. So 
all of our communications um, is informed by some sort of market research. And I think that we've got a really strong network of um, rural people across New Zealand and Australia that we work with to obtain insight before we start um, planning and developing and executing communications. So we very much specialise in the positive research space. So we run a lot of focus groups, um, in-depth interviews and um, customer journey mapping. And then from there, um, we also offer strategic services. So we work with um, a lot of clients on advertising strategy, communication strategy, marketing strategy, and right up to business strategy for small business. And it's really just helping them sort of develop a plan to really, um, you know, navigate that complex environment that I talked about earlier and get their product to market, um, whether it's nationally or internationally. And then from there, we'll then develop um, either uh, full advertising or communications plans or digital tools that help, um, you know, create a direct servicing model um, to really help them grow their, grow their product base. So, yeah, all of that's kind of underpinned by our creative offering, which is obviously developing the messages and the look and feel that, yeah, filters for all those channels. So we've got the research, we've got the strategy, we've got the advertising, um, and we've sort of the creative and digital to, to put them together. So we really are a one-stop shop for agricultural marketing. Right, and they sound really key as well to the business's success. Yeah, yeah, I think um, it really depends to what level that our clients want in first to, to help them on. But, you know, I looked through and looked at today with a, with a startup business that was um, about to launch their product um, in international markets. And, yeah, it's a pretty exciting space. Like, um, I think there's a lot of disruption happening, but with that disruption, um, there's a lot of opportunities. So, yeah, we're, our job is to really help those businesses navigate that, and I think that's what we're looking for. Absolutely. And how are you managing to navigate that disruption? It's not that easy at the moment. Um, I think that, it's, you know, there's a lot of different factors at play. Um, the, the main one being the political side of things. I think that, um, you know, we always try to stay ahead of the curve by doing a lot of insight work. So we speak to a lot of farmers, we speak to a lot of industry leaders, we attend a lot of events. Um, and yeah, just try and get a general sense of yeah, where the market's going and we try and take our, uh, our clients along along that journey. So yeah, it's, I, don't, I actually think uh, New Zealand and Australian agriculture has never experienced so much disruption than what it's experiencing currently. So yeah, it's probably half of my week at the moment is just trying to keep up with what's going on. Well, that is quite surprising there, but it um, seems like you've, uh, you're tackling it quite well. And I understand that you have a project called Reviewless Irrigation. I apologize if I'm saying that incorrectly. Could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Reviewless is a global, it's actually a company, it's a global irrigation giant um, company that's actually based in, out of Israel that we've been working with for a number of years. And yeah, we've done a number of campaigns and worked with them, but um, I think the project you're referring to was the um, Vegetables Love Reviewless um, project. and. It was a really interesting one because um, it was it was targeted or it was irrigation um, communications that was targeted at growers, and we had a look at um, com competitors and what they'd been doing in the space, and they very much focused on talking about what I'd call the rational side of um, customer justification. So they're talking about the return on investment their products gave, uh, talking about the quality and durability and and all those sorts of features that their products had, and. We kind of looked at it and there was four or five competitors all saying the same thing. So in the way we went to market with it is we actually communicated the fact that um, we, we focused on the emotional side and the, the whole tagline which is vegetables love ridiculous um, with a really sort of um, good looking creative behind it. And yeah, it's, it's worked really well because I think that at the end of the day, you know, the inside is farmers pride themselves, farmers and growers pride themselves on the vegetables that they produce, not the top lines that they, that they produce them. So, yeah, we very much focus on that factor and it, it paid off well. Mm. That's really good to hear. So that's sort of part of how you distinguish yourself from your competitors. Mm. Yeah, very much so. I think that, um, you know, we operate in the only in the agricultural space and there's not many um, agencies that actually do that. And that really helps us um, create a a strong point of difference and you know we only all of our clients are in the same sector so we get a lot of sort of cross pollination of insight into different subsectors that make up the ag game and i think that it really helps set us apart from um, those other agencies that sort of dip their toes in with one or two clients all of our clients are in the one sector so yeah we get a pretty good insight into how the industry operates as a whole 
I don't doubt that. And um, in the past, brands like Suzuki Marine, KPMG, and many more have worked with you. Could you maybe shed some light on your current clientele? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we've got a pretty good um, mix of clientele across the agricultural landscape. So we work with um, everyone from agricultural, uh, ag chem suppliers, to fertilizers, to machinery, to um, uh, vet, veterinary, to pretty much all aspects. Where we've got some some form of client at the moment. I've actually got a monopoly board with um, all of the different sectors in ag, and I think there's probably about ten percent that we haven't either worked work with now or we haven't worked with in the past. So, yeah, we, we've got a pretty broad mix, and um, I think you know with some of those clients we work with them um, very on a very in depth basis. So we do all of their strategy and their planning and their research and their execution. And then other clients, we just do um, execution work for. So we might develop a tool or a website or an advertising campaign. But yeah, um, we, we kind of mix who we work with depending on their needs. <laughs> All right. It sounds like you've got a very diverse client base there as well. Yeah, we do. And I think that, um, you know, they are diverse, but they are all in the same sector. Um, but it does allow us, like one of the things we're really looking at at the moment, back to trying to help navigate through that complex landscape is how can we bring our clients together um, so they can actually form kind of groups and collective, um, yeah, to have a collective understanding of where the market's going instead of operating in silos. So there's a few sort of exciting things that we've got planned at the moment to really help help kind of steer the agricultural market in the right direction. Well, that sounds very promising. Now, just to touch on another of your projects, reconnecting with growers. What would you say is the mission and vision of that project? Um, that is a really interesting project because we that's for Insight to fertilise one of our biggest um, parts of the sector. And they are a fertiliser company, and you could argue that a fertiliser supplier is primarily operating in a commodity market. Um, and yeah, when we when they came to us and we looked at planning an initiative, we we sort of did a bit of an analysis of the market and spoke to a few farmers. And what was very clear to us was at the time, you know, farmers were crying out for partnerships and they were crying out for support um, and understanding of what they were going through because it was actually um, when the Australian droughts were on and there was, you know, a lot, they were, there was a lot, they were getting hit with a lot of sort of tough things. And if you looked at any sort of industry or um, agricultural publication, you'd see all the same advertising where they were offering deals and services and um, trying to sort of, what I'd say, put out a hook to get them in and just sell them something. So at the time we thought, well, what's, you know, what's Insitec's biggest um, point of difference? And, you know, it was their people. And we knew that the, the industry actually was crying out for partnerships. So all we really did was we went out to market with a campaign that heroed the Insitec Pivot um, Fertilizers staff and people, you know, down to their first name. And, you know, it really helped resonate with the farmers because that's what they wanted. They didn't want to see a deal in front of them. They wanted to, you know, associate with someone that actually had the care for them, their operation and what they're doing. So in a way, we were just reconnecting growers with, you know, with people that actually wanted to have a proper partnership with them. And that's why it was called reconnecting with growers. Right. So you were essentially filling a need that was unmet by other industry personnel. Yeah, yeah, I think the ag game particularly um, has a few stuff in want is to general, um, what I'd call sort of in general advertising, you know, like um, we know that the agricultural um, market, they're, they're slow to trust, but once they've got a partnership, you, you can have a very sticky tenure, so they last a long time and they're very loyal customers. And I think a lot of agricultural brands get it wrong because they try and do a hard sell up front. Um, whereas, you know, like the initiative of the IPF, we're actually putting the people up front and saying, hi, my name is you know, um, Tom, for example, and I actually want to get to know you. I don't just want to come in and facilitate a transaction and then walk away. So, yeah, I think that's one of the main, I'm giving a bit away here, but, you know, that's one of our main mandates here at Tractor is let's help build brands that want to get to know their customers and not just go and sell them something. Would you say then that customer loyalty has been really key to your success? Um, yeah, in terms of the um, farming market or our clients? Farming market. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, in the marketing game, there's obviously two kind of um, facets to it. There's what we call acquisition, which is getting customers in the door, and then there's um, retention, which is, which is keeping them. And, yeah, I think, you know, 
the, the acquisition side of agricultural marketing is quite difficult because the really a farmers across loads of trust, the farmers and growers across loads of trust. But as long as you've got the quality product and you have a convincing story, they will come. And as long as you do your job and, you know, it goes well, they'll continue to buy off you. And, yeah, that's definitely something that we really pride ourselves in. Like, um, there's been a lot of talk around whether we're a B2B or a B2C agency. And my honest view is we're not really either. I don't really believe in splitting B2B and B2C because, you know, if you have a customer, you have a customer. And as long as you can service them in the way that they want it doesn't really matter what their background is. Um, if you can keep them, they're going to remain a customer. Definitely, and I think, I can imagine that's helped you build those long-lasting client relationships. Now, currently, you're settled, your business is settled in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Do you have any plans for expansion on the horizon? Yeah, well, we kind of fell into Australia, really. We, we started in New Zealand and um, we went quite well and then we picked up one Australian client and then now that's turned into sort of eight to ten Australian clients and now we have over, yeah, well over half of our um, revenue is derived out of Australia. So it's funny how that kind of came about and, um, yeah, that being said, I think that um, we, we've got quite a strong footprint in both countries now and we are potentially on the future looking into Asia, um, given that there's quite a close connection there as well. But um, yeah, it's early days and yeah, I think it's just a case of keeping up with the growth. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, that'll be really good to see and we look forward to your potential expansion to Asia. So keep an eye out viewers. And on that note, it is just about time to wrap up, but I've got to say thanks so much for your time today, Kurt. It's been a great to hear insights. No problem. Thanks for having me. Okay. Pleasure to have pleasure to have you with us. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. As we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. New Zealand is unique. And Calkine TV is here to bring you all the latest news and trending market updates. Streaming across multiple platforms, so no matter where you are, whether it be at the beach or on the farm, you can count on the team here at Calkine TV to be your home for accessing the latest valuable insights into global issues that are affecting New Zealanders. Subscribe to our channels across YouTube, Facebook, also visit calkine.co.nz. intermittent fasting help reduce weight? Hi, I hope you're doing well and keeping healthy. I'm Andy from Calkine Media and you are watching Calkine Wellness. On the show today, we are going to discuss how intermittent fasting can help reduce weight and what are the common methods people adopt to practice such fasting. Now, there are many approaches to mindful weight loss and wellness. Fasting is not a new concept and is common religious practice, in fact, in countries like India and Pakistan during festivals. In the last one decade, health experts have been looking into the benefits of fasting and have found that fasting for two or five days in a month can or may reduce your biomarkers for diabetes, cancer and other chronic and lifestyle diseases. Intermittent fasting can be defined as a cyclic eating pattern where you take turns between eating and fasting. Research shows that intermittent fasting periods do more than burn fat. It helps avoid unwanted snacking and oily and high calorie food throughout the day. Other benefits from this diet trend are things like weight loss, better metabolism, immune boosting and healthy aging benefits and of course a longer life. A few experts also highlight that intermittent diet can be helpful for chronic diseases like anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome, high cholesterol and can play a crucial role in maintaining one's brain health. The main goal of this fasting is to give your body a break from digestion and concentrate on recovery and maintenance instead. 
It also is important to note that it helps in weight loss, which is what we all love. When you don't consume carbohydrates for a few hours, the body gets into a state called ketosis. We've all heard of the keto diet, a process wherein the fat stored in your body is used to generate energy and extra weight is then shed. There are many ways to do intermittent fasting. The most popular one is fasting for 16 hours and eating only during the remaining eight hours. One can add three or more meals in this eight hour window. And under this, most enthusiasts skip breakfast and shun eating after 8 p.m. Another method is a 5.2 diet where one eats five days a week and restricts the calorie intake during the next two days to 500 to 600 calories. This is also called the fast diet and was popularized by British reporter Michael Mosley. This method also allows the consumer water and coffee, but no solid food or junk food is ever permitted. The third popular way is to eat, stop, eat. Here one fasts for 24 hours at a stretch once or twice a week. Enthusiasts usually fast from dinner one day to dinner the next day. Another popular one is the warrior diet, which you may have heard of, in which one eats small portions of vegetables and fruits all day and has one huge meal at the very end of the day. However, any form of diet is not recommended for children, people with diabetes, pregnant women, or people with eating disorders. Also, people who are recovering from surgery or any other chronic diseases, it's important to check with your health practitioner of choice. In fact, it's best to consult a nutritionist or any other relevant experts that you're working with before taking on any diet plan. Now, if you like this information, Please like, share and comment on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon to get the latest notifications. And for regular updates and information in general, do log on to our website, calkinemedia.com. You are watching Andy Lou with Wellness and Calkine Media. Talk by Kalkine, the crypto market has been red hot given the Bitcoin rally since the past year. And now the most famous cryptocurrency has got competitors, Dogecoin and Ethereum. If the crypto market excites you, tune in with me, Sage, to know the latest developments about the existing digital currencies and the new ones that are joining the race. I'll help you understand the opportunities and the risks the crypto market has in store for you. For all the digital currency related developments, continue watching Crypto Talk by Kalkine. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in to Cowkind TV. James Preston with you, and it's another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today, I'll be sitting down with the founder of Quint Digital, Harpreet Singh. A Melbourne-based Quint Digital is a full-service digital marketing agency that helps businesses achieve unprecedented growth. The company has been built from the ground up by Harpreet, who has over a decade worth of experience in sales, and he currently heads the digital growth segment at Quint Digital, and it's now my great pleasure to welcome him to the show. Harpreet Singh, a very good afternoon to you, my friend. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting James. Um, it's, it's my pleasure. Well, Harpreet, before we get into the nitty-gritty of it, I've just got to compliment you on the uh, the whole aesthetic here because, of course, with digital marketing, so much is about what does it look like, what can we put out there to the public, and between the white blazer, the blue shirt, and that beautiful background, mate, it is all happening. I love it. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. No worry at all, Harpreet. Now, look, uh, I mentioned in the intro itself that you offer a full-service digital marketing campaign, but what exactly does that entail, and could you break down the different services that Quint Digital offers? Yeah, definitely. You know, full service means end-to-end -end service. Uh, what we offer our small and medium businesses is starting from web design to lead generation, Google Ads, social media marketing, and search engine optimization. So put it in a nutshell for you is whatever a small business needs to grow their business, we offer that service. 
Perfect. And so are there individual packages within that full service that maybe a company is falling short on one particular aspect and you say, yes, we can provide that particular service as well? Yep, so when a company comes to us or whenever a small business approaches us, we do a thorough audit of their current online assets and we then present that back to the small business owners. Um, we, we do a complete gap analysis of where the business is lacking and where the business should be focused on. And depending on our analysis and depending on our gaps, then we do a custom package for each business. So we don't have a cookie cutter approach. Uh, every business is, is different. They're at the different stages of the life cycle and the solution would be different for each business. So there's no cookie cutter approach. We do a thorough analysis of when a business comes, to, comes and speaks to us and then present a growth plan depending on where they are in the life cycle. Yeah, brilliant. And look, I think that leads in quite nicely to my next question for you. What makes Quint Digital a go-to agency for small business in Australia? When, when uh, a few years ago, when I decided to start a marketing agency, the gap I saw in the market was there was there was a lot of churn and burn going on in the industry. A lot of big companies didn't care about the dollar spend, didn't care about the small medium businesses, and didn't really care about the results. So whenever a small business owner hold them accountable or try to hold them accountable, they'll just present some you know random numbers and the rankings and the traffic. Um, the gap we saw that if we wanted to be accountable. So our focus is on results. Um, mm. So the three key reasons why we are a good fit for a small medium business. One, we are a small business like themselves. So we understand the, the value of each dollar. Uh, you know, when, when someone spends a dollar on, you know, paid marketing, the return on investment should be the key criteria. That should be the only KPI. Are they making five, 10, $15 return on ad spend? So that's the number one thing. Second, we're very transparent. So we share our challenges openly with the business. We show them where the gaps are. We show them what we're trying, uh, and we show them the results after that. And three, we, we are making our packages very affordable. We are a lean business. We are a lean startup. Uh, so we make sure that the, the marketing packages, the digital marketing solution we offer to these small businesses is very affordable. And the last thing I'll say is we are in a, for a long-term relationship. So we don't believe in contracts. Um, we want them to. We want a small business to stay with us because they see the result, not because they're locked in uh, into a contract. So these are, you know, the, the few main things why small business should choose us and why we are a go-to, you know, option for a small business. So with that contract itself, then, what do the terms look like? Do you say, look, we're going to uh, achieve a certain amount of results, and until we get to that point, there's no sort of finalization of the contract, or there's no payout? How does it work exactly? So, so, so there's no uh, locked-in contract, so it's all month-to-month -month services, so it's pay-as-you-go. Um, so each month, uh, let's say we start a campaign, we set an objective, we sit down with the customer, we understand what the objectives are, where they're lacking, what sort of revenue they're currently doing, and what sort of goals do they have. Hmm. Then we work on unit economics, so we work out what, what the cost of leads going to be, we, then we work out the conversion rates. So it's all, you know, all scientific. We can, you know, after a couple of months into the campaign, we can start, you know, forecasting as well, three, six, and 12 months goal, where we understand, you know, if you spend $1, you're going to get that many leads, and uh, based on the conversion rate of the business, we understand how much revenue that's going to generate. So that's, you know, that's how this normal setup looks like. Yeah, perfect. Now, look, we've already touched on this as well, given you've got sort of a, a full approach and there's also somewhat of an auditing system that goes on to find out exactly what kind of marketing each business needs. But can you delve into a little bit more detail the multi-dimensional marketing strategy that you guys implement? Yeah, so look, uh, multi-dimensional came, came through because um, a lot of the business, when I started, a lot of the businesses would, you know, approach me and say, look, I want to do search engine optimization, or I want to do Facebook ads, or I want to do Google ads. Uh, then they, they heard it from, you know, someone or their friend um, that they need to do search engine optimization, uh, but they didn't realize that's just only a one-dimensional approach. So what we do is we prepare a plan for, you know, the customer, a small business owner, um, cannot wait six, 12 months to get the results. You know, search engine optimization is sort of a longer game. Um, we don't neglect that, that's part of a plan, but we also work on getting instant results for the customer, which is through paid ads. So we use either Google ads, YouTube ads, display ads, search, and Facebook. So we use a blend of all these channels to produce the result. The only API we focus on is the result, you know, result and return on investment. So we don't worry about the channel. We are a channel agnostic agency. Yeah. Uh, wherever we see the, the, the best possible return for the business, we'll use and you know, utilize that channel. And that's what multidimensional is. Using all these you know, channels, we are the, we are the best performing, uh, where we can get the best performance out and you know, uh, prepare a formula for them. 
Well, still somewhat on that concept of multi-dimensional marketing. Obviously, we're now in an, yep. an age of convergence. There's so many different platforms, TV, there's still print, even though it's hanging on by a bare thread. Uh, there's things like this with Kalkine TV, new streaming platforms. How challenging it is for you to every year or two, we get something like TikTok coming out, another new platform. Do you have to grow and adapt quite quickly to keep up with that? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, as, as the new channels come out, you get the opportunity of reaching additional audience. And because the channel is new, you know, you also learn, uh, you grow your skill as well. But there are, you know, low, there are opportunities for low hanging fruit on, you know, channels like TikTok, Snapchat, even LinkedIn, you know, so we, we use mm. all of these channels. And whenever a new channel comes in, we, we proactively try that. We try that first on our campaigns. And then we take the result to our customers. So, look, do you want to try this? Because we tried this at, for Quint campaigns, and this is the result we saw. Now, Harpreet, in your opinion, what are the key steps for any business to outgrow its competition and then achieve unprecedented growth? Uh, look, um, the biggest tip I can give a small business, so, you know, I can give three tips here. One, mm. um, the ability to be found online. So when someone's searching, to give you an example of a roof restoration business, when someone's searching for a roof restoration, you know, on Google, if your business is not there and doesn't have the ability to be found when your consumer is looking for you, um, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So the number one thing is be found. Second, have a consistent and concise message on all your social media, all your website. Um, as a business, have a consistent message across all the channels. Um, so once you've got the traffic, the second thing we've got to focus on, to focus on is converting that traffic into your know, leads. Um, and that's done through sharp messaging. So get found, have a really good message and offer for the customer, and three, conversion rate optimization. Always be improving. You know, The message which might have worked six months ago, one year ago, doesn't always work the same way. So keep an eye on numbers, understand what your customers are doing when they come on the website and adapt according to your customers' you know, behavior. Yeah, I think that's a really common sense approach. Obviously, the whole marketing landscape and, well, society more generally, especially in the last sort of 18 months, constantly changing, evolving, new different challenges. You can't have a, a one-stock approach to it, I guess. Just before I let you go, Harpreet, what would be your advice to businesses who may have hit a growth ceiling and they're experiencing a bit of a stagnant growth at this time? Look, uh, if you've hit a growth ceiling, we encourage you to get an audit done. You know, get a fresh set of eyes to look at your campaigns, get a thorough audit done, understand where the gaps are, and then adapt and do a multi-dimensional approach of the campaigns. You know, your, your audience is sitting on Google, they're sitting on social media, they're sitting on LinkedIn, so do not neglect any channel. Uh, use all these channels, utilize all these channels to take your business to the you know, next step of the growth. Brilliant. Well, Harpreet, there's plenty of insights you've shared with our viewers there. So I really do appreciate you joining us here on Kalkine TV. It's been great to catch up. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Perfect, mate. Hopefully we can get you back on here again. Cheers. Take care. Lovely. Well, that's Harpreet Singh, co-founder of Full Service Digital Marketing Agency, Quint Digital. And if you tuned in a little late and you would like to catch up on the whole interview or check out any of the other expert talks we've had on Kalkine TV, make sure to head across to our YouTube channel, Kalkine Media. And above all, remember to stay prize and invest wise with Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Discussing the far-reaching benefits of mindfulness and meditation. Hello there, I hope you are staying inspired and keeping well. This is Andy Lou from Kalkine Media and you are watching my show, Kalkine Wellness. Today let's discuss the benefits of mindfulness meditation. Meditation is becoming an increasingly popular practice in our modern world as people are discovering a compelling link between physical well-being and meditation. One such prominent meditation technique is what we are now describing as mindfulness. And this allows people to gain a non-judgmental, deep awareness of their emotions, feelings and sensations. 
while sitting upright with your eyes closed, feet flat on the floor and palms resting on the laps, individuals can practice mindfulness by paying attention to their bodily sensations like breath, emotions, thoughts and of course their heartbeats. Over the recent years, several rigorous scientific studies have shown the unequivocal benefits of a regular mindfulness meditation practice. A research published in Clinical Psychology Review in 2013 evaluated the efficacy of mindfulness-based therapy, the MBT, using a comprehensive effective size analysis. Researchers examined over 200 studies of mindfulness among healthy people and discovered that mindfulness-based therapy was especially effective for reducing anxiety, stress and even depression. This is just one example. Many such studies have also investigated the benefits of mindfulness meditation in different medical conditions too. While no such study suggests that perhaps mindfulness meditation is going to be a standalone treatment for any disease, the benefits of this practice are far-reaching for mental and even physical health. So let us quickly discuss some of these benefits one by one. It might relieve stress. A study conducted by American Psychological Association demonstrated that nearly 7 in 10 Americans have experienced increased stress over the course of this particular period, the pandemic. Moreover, nearly 8 in 10 Americans also accepted that the pandemic is a significant source of stress in their lives. At a time when increased stress levels are becoming more prominent than ever before, individuals can embrace mindfulness meditation to cope with this problem and indeed it is a problem. Interestingly, stress reduction is the most commonly reported benefit of mindfulness so far. Mindfulness meditation is believed to reduce the release of things like inflammatory chemicals caused by stress called cytokines and meditation allows individuals to calm their inner chatter while bringing perspective and clarity to what's going on inside them. That inner voice can sometimes get to us, enabling us to deal with stress. It's such an important thing. Improves physical health sometimes by this practice. Another great advantage of mindfulness techniques is that you might get to help improve physical health in several ways. Mindfulness techniques can help treat things like heart disease, reduce chronic pain, lower blood pressure, alleviate gastrointestinal difficulties and even might improve your sleep. Most of these ailments are triggered by a prolonged increase in stress levels as chronic stress usually translates into emotional strain and then into physical pain. Mindfulness practice enhances people's physical condition by reducing their stress levels. Meanwhile, mindfulness meditation trains individuals to become more sensitive to their needs of their physical body. And this helps people to develop the ability to exert greater control over their unpleasant feelings like pain. It also might control anxiety. Now, anxiety is inferred as the cognitive state of mind connected to an inability of people to regulate their emotions. And people who have ever been in the grip of anxiety very well know how intense it really can be. Individuals can only control and manage anxiety if they understand it well. And mindfulness meditation, along with movement, also allows people to understand the erratic nature of anxiety whilst obtaining a better sense of triggering situations. But with meditation, people tend to learn about the thoughts and how they actually define them and thoughts that are perhaps unreal or not true. And this in turn changes their relationship with anxiety and improves one's ability to regulate emotions. Perhaps it might boost concentration too and improve memory. Having problems concentrating is not just a children's problem, it also affects billions of grown-ups and us adults as well. So, daily practice of mindfulness meditation is believed to improve concentration amongst children and adults whilst bolstering their ability to keep information active in their minds.
Well, mindfulness meditation helps individuals to focus on one specific subject at a time whilst instilling in them a deep sense of appreciation for the present moment. Besides, studies suggest that mindfulness improves the density of the hippocampus part of the brain and that's the section that's connected to learning and memory. The mindfulness boosts the areas that are responsible for helping individuals remember things more vividly. That's why when we're completely stressed we start to forget. So it could help us focus better and enhance self-awareness with this practice. And more precisely, mindfulness meditation targets core brain networks, which play a key role in many cognitive tasks, making brain activities more efficient too. Perhaps for you it might build emotional resilience. Resilience is the process of effectively dealing with adversity or bouncing back from difficulties. It allows people to cope with daily struggles while developing professionally, emotionally and psychologically. There is considerable evidence that shows mindfulness meditation increases resilience whilst improving the satisfaction and life satisfaction among individuals. Mindfulness practice strengthen and emotional and logical centers of people's brains, increasing the awareness and the attention of the present moment by just being. Now with such practices, individuals can experience emotions without judgment. Some people don't like to call mindfulness meditation prayer, but it's a similar practice and you can regulate behavioral responses to them without this judgment, building emotional resilience and more peace within your body. So many amazing benefits of practicing this mindfulness and individuals can simply improve their well-being by starting with just a few minutes a day. You can do it anywhere without specific or special equipment or have to enroll into a class or mindful meditation course. You can just do it and enhance your quality of life. Remember, brilliant things happen in a calm mind. Now if you like this information, please share and feel free to comment on the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to press the bell icon to get those latest notifications. And for regular updates and information in general, do log on to our website calkindmedia.com. You are watching Andy Lou with Wellness and Calkind Media. This is Andy Liu broadcasting from Kalkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Kalkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Kalkine TV and join me. Stay tuned for Kalkine Media, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to be notified of the latest videos. Today we're covering a topic, seven popular brokerage platforms for the Australian stock market. transactions in the stock market be it buying or selling are facilitated through a stockbroker and making any transaction of listed securities requires an access to that exchange however not everyone has a direct access to the exchange therefore an intermediary is needed to bridge the gap between investors and the exchange and here a brokerage firm fills that gap a stockbroker or a brokerage firm is an affiliated member or a recognised stock exchange which buys or sells security on behalf of its clients. All the orders of clients are routed to the stock exchange via a brokerage firm. And this is the core business of a brokerage firm for which it charges a nominal fee known as commission or brokerage. The brokerage varies depending upon the stockbroker uh, turnover or volume. 
of the transactions, etc. Australian citizens have plenty of options to choose from while selecting a stockbroker that is affiliated to the Australian Securities Exchange or ASX. All these brokerage firms are regulated by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission or ASIC. Let us have a brief look now at some of the prominent brokerage firms in Australia. CMC Markets. CMC Markets is a fully fledged brokerage firm offering a wide range of instruments such as a forex instrument, cryptocurrencies, shares and ETFs, commodities and even treasuries. Apart from this, it also provides state-of-the-art online trading platforms offering dynamic charting capabilities, numerous technical indicators, multiple platforms, support etc and with a 24-hour customer support CMC markets is one of the widely used brokerage platforms in Australia IG IG provides access to thousands of financial markets and easily makes it to the top of the list of brokers in Australia with awards like the Finder Award 2020 for the best low-cost brokerage and Investopedia's Online Brokers Awards 2019 for the best broker for Forex trading. Providing access to over 17,000 markets and facilities to trade in extended hours in the US market is what separates IG from other brokerages. Comsec. Comsec is one of the largest brokers in Australia providing access to 25 recognized exchanges worldwide, including the widely traded New York Stock Exchange or the NYSE and the London Stock Exchange or the LSE. The brokerage is slightly on a higher side but the unmatched research such as exclusive research reports from Goldman Sachs and Morningstar or tools such as Economic Calendar makes it well worth it. Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers is a global brand in the stockbroking industry, operating in 33 countries and 135 markets. It offers competitive brokerages for which it is used by many small or retail investors. It also provides low cost financing services, leading to a higher turnover on its platform. The high tech trading platform. 100 plus complex order types for algorithmic trading and comprehensive real-time reporting makes interactive brokers one of the most technological advanced brokers out there. Bell Direct. Bell Direct is solely focused on the domestic market and provides access to almost all the ASX listed securities such as shares, ETFs, warrants, options, IPOs, XTBs exchange traded bond units etc and Bell Direct provides a daily market snapshot covering all the buzzing news and events free of cost for new investors it also offers free proprietary resources to understand the world of financial markets NAB trade CanStar has awarded NabTrade five stars for its outstanding value for five consecutive years. Apart from the Australian market, it provides access to other markets such as the US, the UK, Germany and Hong Kong. It has also partnered with industry leading research providers such as Thomson Reuters. Morningstar, etc. to provide comprehensive research to its clients. Self Wealth. Last but not least, Melbourne based stockbroker Self Wealth is an online only brokerage house with over 85,000 active Australian investors with a daily trading turnover of over 80 million Australian dollars. It offers a host of security features such as two factor authentication, chess sponsored shareholdings, and active account monitoring. It also is one of the most popular trading platforms for the US market in Australia. Australia. So how to choose your broker? With tons of options present in the Australian market, it becomes quite a task to figure out the best broker. A stockbroker should be selected after a thorough due diligence as a bad decision could be disastrous for an investor or trader. So no investor would want to face technical glitches with their broker or would want to pay high commissions. And on that note, we have compiled a list of a few points that could be looked upon while selecting a stockbroker. Let's take a look at them now.
commissions. Commissions is the majority of the cost that an investor incurs while transacting. Commissions slowly eats into your profits, which may not seem much of a worry in the short term, but could make a huge impact in the long run. And therefore, competitive brokerage could be the first layer of filter. Availability of securities or markets. Not all brokers provide access to all securities and all markets. For example, a broker might be covering the entire Australian market, but not global markets. And also, many brokers do not provide access to all currency pairs, excluding those that generally have very less volume. Therefore, one needs to make sure the selected broker offers access to their desired market or instruments. Research reports. A lot of investors prefer research reports and other research tools to help them make investment decisions. Although nowadays almost every broker provides their own in-house research, yet this domain is quite vast and investors need to look at which kind of research they are interested in. Account security. Account security should not be overlooked and be taken into account with utmost priority. Although the ASIC regulates and monitors all stockbrokers in Australia, it is still better to stick with a reputed broker. Customer support. An essential service from brokers. Customer support must be of high quality. In cases of the account getting compromised or technical glitches from the broker's end, customer support becomes a crucial aspect for the business. And also, some investors are not tech savvy and like to place orders via a call, which also requires uninterrupted and seamless support from the stockbroker. Thanks for joining us on the report. If you like this information, please like, share and comment on the video below and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Press the bell icon and you'll be notified of the latest videos. And for more information and regular updates, please head to the website, calcimedia.com. And this is Sage here for Calci Media. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Holly Shields here for Calcine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. This show where we bring to you industry leaders, successful business owners and market experts all under one roof to help you discover the latest economic insights. On today's show we're joined by Nico King, Executive Creative Director of Chaos Theory, Sydney's leading game and app studio. Welcome to the show Nico, it's a pleasure to have you on. Hi Holly, thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. First of all, I've got to say the name Chaos Theory for a game development company is pretty awesome. Where was that inspiration from? Uh, I founded the company with my two business partners when we were about 12 years old and we had the name back when we were 12. Uh, it's essentially the, the ripple effect or the butterfly effect where a small change in initial conditions can lead to a drastically different result. So our belief is that we can create uh, beautiful, inspiring games that uh, change people's lives and inspire a better future uh, just through this little drop in the bucket that will have big ripple effects. That is very cool indeed and well thought out, I must say, especially for 12. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, to kick things off, Chaos Theory specializes in not only games for fun, but also in serious games and marketing games too. How does the game development process differ between these types? So the, the game development process itself is very similar. It's mainly a difference in the objective. So with an entertainment game, the objective is to make a fun game and there are multiple different types of fun that you can focus on. Uh, whereas a serious game might have an objective such as education or marketing or behavior change. Uh, so with a serious game, you'd really start with researching the subject matter, uh, what's the education content that you're looking to teach people and getting a really fundamental understanding of that. And then from there, you would come up with a game design framework and figure out ways to, to fit that content into the game design framework. A, an entertainment game might start with a creative concept or uh, just a moment of inspiration, or it might start with 
uh, wanting to simulate something or capture a particular type of font. Uh, and then usually that's really honed through prototyping and playtesting and finding what that f core fun element is. Um, and then the game development process itself is similar from, from then on where you're doing software development, you're doing creative development, you're creating art to go into it, you're doing playtesting, getting feedback, uh, looking at your results, looking at your metrics, and yeah, really trying to refine it and make it the best game that it can be. Right, it sounds like a lot goes into those games regardless of their type. Definitely. It's, it's a very interesting blend between different disciplines where you've got the technical side of things, which is very logic, it's uh, software development, it's uh, pr programming, and then there's the creative uh, side of things, which is uh, blue skies, uh, a, a very different mindset that you bring in. So the collaboration between those two disciplines is sometimes causes a bit of friction, uh, but yeah, you end up with a, with a pretty incredible end result. Right, and now many might think that serious games is an oxymoron, but your company Chaos Theory proves this isn't really the case. What kinds of impacts can these games achieve? I think I'd agree that serious games is a bit of an oxymoron. I don't think it's the best term for what they are. Uh, I like the term applied games or games for good or games for change. Uh, serious games uh, was coined quite a while ago and has stuck around just because that's what everybody keeps on referring to it as. Um, so yeah, I, I like to think of them as any any game with a primary purpose lies outside of pure entertainment. Um, and yeah, my, my preference is definitely for games for change. That'd be any game that has a social message or looking to change people's behavior, uh, anything that's uh, educational focused. Um, I think some of the best examples, in my opinion, of games for change are games that started out as an entertainment focus. So Minecraft is an example, uh, very uh, entertainment focused, but at the same time teaches people uh, very fundamental logic skills and they ended up making the Minecraft educational edition in order to really fully capitalize on that. People can do computing and, and hardware design in Minecraft and create uh, elaborate contraptions. People have created things like a, a fully functional Game Boy Color playing Pokemon uh, all in a Minecraft environment. Uh, so those sorts of uh, fundamental logic skills uh, similar to what we would have originally liked from something like Lego uh, can really be captured in uh, a gaming environment or an interactive digital format. Um, that's not to say that uh, serious games or games that are purpose-built for uh, the the purpose can't also be equally successful. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the mass market appeal and the wide impact of those other games, those uh, entertainment focused games can be uh, really uh, powerful. Right, and those kinds of skills are really key to the development of young minds, wouldn't you say? Definitely. And I think one of the things that really inspired myself to get into game development was the impact that games had on my own life. So uh, just I played a lot of games when I was growing up and they taught me a lot of fundamental logic and problem solving skills. Uh, one of the real benefits of games is that uh, you essentially make a contract or a pact with a game that if I try hard enough, I can overcome any challenge or any obstacle in this game and then I can win, which is just a really good fundamental life skill to have where you've got a very tenacious approach to problem solving and sometimes life isn't that fair, sometimes there isn't a good solution or a way to win, uh, but I think people that play games have been shown to uh, have more determination and uh, try again and again and again. Right, another useful skill to have, definitely. And now, you've created marketing games for big names like Samsung and M&Ms. Could you maybe shed some light on your current client base? Sure. Uh, we're currently working with the United Nations World Food Program on a large-scale applied game project uh, that's focused on changing behavior around pr protection and accountability risk management. Uh, if that means anything to you. 
Um, we recently developed a game to uh, for the Australian government, so for the Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, which was looking to raise awareness for um, e education or um, trying to attract international students to learn and learn biology and uh, sciences, science subjects in Australia. Uh, we also work with some local government bodies. Um, we do also do pure entertainment focused work. So we're working with mobile game publishers to create games in the casual and hyper casual space uh, that have uh, tens of millions of downloads on the successful titles. Uh, and then we also work with a lot of universities and uh, various agencies for, from marketing agencies to learning and co learning content agencies. Uh, so definitely a very eclectic mix of different clients. Uh, I think that games and especially applied games is still quite an emerging field and it, there tends to be a, a small group from within an organization that will do some research, see the benefits of games and really reach out and pioneer the use of games within their organization. Absolutely. And, you know, some of the things you mentioned, I think, are absolutely crucial for us at the moment, especially attracting international students. That's something we could really use here in Australia in light of the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. And we're also working with a uh, immersive 3D video conferencing company. So essentially they have created, or for them, we have created a immersive 3D world using a game engine where you can walk around using your keyboard and mouse uh, and you have a little screen with your head on it and you can uh, group up with different people in a learning environment and it has a lot of the benefits of uh, teleconferencing but also the benefits of an in-person education environment where you can break out into different groups, speak to the people around you, uh, there's lots of uh, digital uh, billboards or digital workspaces that are around the environment that you can walk up to, you can project your screen to it, um, and multiple different environments that you can go to. So that's a, an Australian company called ICVC, uh, I, I S E E, I C V C. Um, so yeah, and they, they've seen a lot of growth uh, because of the pandemic. So I think from both angles, both attracting international students and providing distance education and, and facilitating the process of uh, remote learning is something that games can be really beneficial or games can help out in. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. And just to touch on the funding issue, you're obviously aware of the 30% digital games tax offset that was announced in this year's budget. What do you think the impact will be for our game development industry? I think that uh, it's obviously going to lead to growth. Um, it's, in my personal opinion, it's a really wise move from the Australian government. Uh, globally, the, globally, the video game industry is bigger than the movie industry and the music industry combined. Uh, so it's, and it's growing at a rapid pace. It's growing at, at an increasing race. It's growing at a incredible pace. Uh, uh, I think for a comparison, Canada is a really good comparison to Australia. Uh, Canada has supported their games industry for quite a while now, and they've got a similar population to uh, Australia, uh, both former British col colonies, uh, uh, and yeah, similar population. Their games industry is about five times as large as ours is. Um, so seeing what a strong games industry can look like uh, is really something that we can use use to model our own system on. Uh, I believe they have a similar tax offset, so I believe it's a production, production tax offset. Uh, so hopefully we can replicate some of that success. And I think it can go uh, down to multiple different levels. The, there was a visa scheme that was just announced for a permanent path to, to residency in Australia uh, through game development. So that's one thing that the uh, IGEA, which is the Australian body for, for video game developers, uh, has been lobbying for for a very long time because attracting talent, talent to Australia is one of the biggest challenges that we've faced and currently face. Uh, and a lot of our senior talent has previously gone overseas 
and getting them back is one thing, but if we want to grow the in industry, we need talented people. And when talented people can choose to live anywhere in the world uh, and they're considering Australia, a, a path to permanent residency and eventually citizenship is definitely something that is a, a big plus in their books. Uh, so, yeah, the, the tax office offset itself uh, should really help to uh, attract some of the larger studios uh, and bring them to Australia, and then that will have ripple down effects for the the large, the medium, and the small size studios, where that senior talent is going to come to Australia. Uh, it's going to create an ecosystem. There are going to be other businesses that pop up to support those larger studios via offering services such as outsourced uh, art and and programming and sound design. Uh, so I think, yeah. Getting those large studios is definitely one of the focuses of this tax offset, and it's definitely a, a massive uh, positive step in the right direction. That's really good to hear. I mean, it seems like we uh, could use all the help we get. Yeah, definitely. I think the, the Australian games industry has been great in terms of its... the... the it, it doesn't feel very competitive uh, between myself and the other studios that I speak to. It feels like we're playing on an international stage. We're all helping each other out. Um, Australian games are quite renowned for being high quality and uh, I guess punching above their weight. Um, there have been some massive hits that have come out of uh, uh, Australia, both kind of console and mobile games. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely, we're not necessarily struggling, but I think encouraging the growth of the video game industry is a positive step for the Australian government, uh, it's a positive step for Australian game developers, and hopefully it's a, a positive step for everybody in the world because they'll get to enjoy uh, great cultural exports that w or cultural pieces of work that we create, that we export all around the world. Um, it's a I forget the term, but it's a, a weightless product or it's a digital product, so once we develop it once, uh, it doesn't really cost anything to manufacture it. Um, and yeah, it's just a really, really good market for the Australian government to be investing in growing. Definitely, and that'll be good to see in the future. Hopefully we get the best outcome possible for our industry. And before we close, what is next for Chaos Theory? Is there anything on the horizon that we should keep an eye out for? I think the, so the, the work that we're doing for the United Nations World Food Program should be released in the next few months. So uh, if you're interested in serious games or what a large uh, NGO producing a serious game would look like, uh, it's definitely something to keep keep an eye out for. Uh, we, we definitely want to continue working with similar organizations, with government organizations, uh, basically championing uh, applied games, games for change, and showing all of the good that they can do in the world. I think the term games sometimes has some stigma around it of it being only for play or only for leisure, but really they're just interactive experiences that leverage human psychology to get us to do things, including change our behavior. So uh, the, the future of games, I think, is much broader than only play. Um, and we're actually, we're helping put together a, um, a festival or a conference called Games for Change Asia Pacific, uh, which is all about the games for change, games for good, applied games, serious games, uh, and how to use them, how to design them, what other people are doing. Uh, so that's coming up in October. So if you're interested in that, uh, just look at look for Games for Change Asia Pacific. And uh, there's a website, we're on social media. Uh, so that's going to be exciting. It's the inaugural festival uh, that we have uh, brought over from the it was in the United States. We're doing the inaugural Asia Pacific version of, of the festival in October. Okay, well that is very good to hear. We'll be keeping an eye on that festival and anyone who wants to check it out can do so. And with that, it is just about time to wrap up, but thanks so much for joining us today, Nico. Your insights have been invaluable. Thank you very much, Holly. And thanks so much for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live market updates. As we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi, 
This is Andy Liu broadcasting from Kalkine Media Studio in Australia and I'll be hosting the new Kalkine Wellness Show. The half hour show will cover topics from how wellness as a concept has become even more significant during COVID to how becoming vegan may improve your health and much more. We are excited to showcase our live streaming show to our audience of millions overseas and in Australia. Tune in to Kalkine TV and join me.